The Catholic Church guides 1.2 billion believers around the world. But no one has unraveled the mysteries of the Vatican. The independent state, capital of the church, fraught with secrecy. A text written several centuries ago could bring major changes. The prophecy of the popes. A prophecy that seems to have been at the heart of Vatican power. A prophecy that the church appears to have hidden from the world for centuries. All these events were planned, written, and announced by Malachi of Armagh, the author of this prophecy. A text with 111 cryptic phrases. It lists all of the popes from the 12th century to present day. The prophecy is very precise. More worrying, the list ends with a punishment, a single paragraph announcing the end of the papacy, the destruction of Rome, and Judgment Day, all set to happen only a few years from now. God can do what he wants, and if he decides that he does not need the papacy, then there will be no more papacy. For Malachi Francis is the last pope. The world will end, so there has to be a last pope. What's going to happen? The collapse of Rome. That's what we're told. Is Francis the last pope? Pray for me. Has the end of the world been announced, or is it just another apocalyptic prophecy? Everything is made to measure, and we see nothing. Let's look at the prophecy of the popes in detail. It has proven its worth over the last few centuries. Let's head to the Library of Lyon, where the work which contains the prophecy of the popes is preciously preserved. Even though it was written in the 12th century, the Prophecy of the Popes was published in 1595 as a simple chapter in the book Lignum Vitae. Jean-Marie Beuzelin, the author of the surprising prophecy of Saint Malachi, reveals its secrets. A Benedictine, a Benedictine Arnold Villon, wrote a book called Lignum Vitae, here before us, wrote the prophecy attributed to Saint Malachi. In fact, it's a text that was discovered at the end of the 16th century, in 1590 to be precise, by a Benedictine monk called Arnold Villon of Venice. He claimed he had discovered by an extraordinary stroke of luck the prophetic text written in the 12th century by Malachi. The prophecy is strictly speaking in the left column a succession of very short phrases in Latin. On the right are the notes of Arnold Villon and the other Benedictines who studied the text with him. The prophecy of Saint Malachi has the list of the 111 popes and an epilogue. Plus un envoi. The 111 phrases are supposed to characterize all the popes from Pope Celestine II until the last on the list, Benedict XVI. After that, there's a break, followed by a longer and more explicit 112th prediction. The mystery is that the 112th entry is followed by a kind of prophecy. The only real prophecy of the prophecy of Saint Malachi is the 112th phrase. Pope Benedict XVI is the 111th of the list leaving only the last paragraph of the prophecy of the popes to be fulfilled, and the events that it announces are particularly chilling. In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations, and when these things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The End the last text of the prophecy of Malachi announces three things. The first is that the last pope will be called Peter the Roman. Second, that the church will undergo extreme persecution. And the third is that Rome will be destroyed.
the apocalypse, the end of the papacy, and Judgment Day. If one takes the last paragraph of Malachi's prophecy literally, the events awaiting us are horrifying. This is the end of the world, it's Judgment Day. We are told bluntly that Pope Francis will experience Judgment Day along with us. According to different interpretations of the prophecy, Francis will become the most famous pope of all, the one who will be there till the very end. For Malachi, Francis is the last pope. His pontificate will therefore mark the end of the countdown. We're on the edge of an abyss. What will happen to us now? Should we believe it? Who's this mysterious Malachi of Armagh, and how did he foretell the end? Malachi? Malachi, originally Ua Morger, was born in a small town in the north of Ireland in 1095. During that period, although attached to Rome, Ireland had managed to retain Celtic traditions. Catholicism was gaining ground, but was yet to be the predominant religion. He was appointed Bishop of Ireland by the Pope of the time, pursued a lifelong career as a Benedictine, and was very close to Bernard de Clairvaux. As a young Catholic, Saint Malachi climbed the ecclesiastical ladder at considerable speed. At 25, he was a priest, and he quickly became primat of Ireland, and therefore one of the first Catholics of Ireland. One night in 1140, he experienced a vision, but not just any vision, a vision of all the popes, from Celestine II in 1143 to the very last, all in Latin verses. So why would we be interested in an obscure text claimed to have been written by this 12th century Irish monk? In other words, can we trust Saint Malachi? It is said that Saint Malachi, as his contemporaries report, had the gift of prophecy, but in his papers no trace of prophecies have ever been found. To find traces of the prophetic gift of Saint Malachi, one must get closer to his biography written by his friend Saint Bernard de Clairvaux. He points out that Saint Malachi is gifted with foresight and that he even predicted his own death. To the religious people who asked him where he wished to die, the Irish monk replied, at Clairvaux. And when? On the Day of the Dead, the 2nd of November. The very same year, in 1148, on his way to Rome, Malachi fell ill. He stopped to see his friend Saint Bernard in Clairvaux and died on the 2nd of November. But this is not enough to make Malachi a great prophet. The only way to believe in a prophet is to witness proof of his prophecies. Let's dive back into Malachi's list of the 111 popes. First phrase, ex Caftro Tiberis, from the castle of the Tiber. Pope Celestine II was born in Città di Castello, the castle town formerly known as Tifernum, which has the same root as the word Tiber. Second phrase, Inimsius Expulfus, the hunted enemy, refers to Pope Lucius II, who was driven out of Rome by the Senate, the main enemy of the church at the time. Third phrase, ex magnitudine montis, from Monte Magno. Before becoming Pope, Eugene III was called Bernardo Paganelli di Monte Magno, and it continues on like this. All the phrases make us dream. They make us dream about the symbols at the heart of the church. For nearly 900 years, the whole history of the papacy seems to be written on these pieces of paper. The Benedictine monk Arnold Villon discovered and published a prophetic text in the 16th century. According to him, Saint Malachi, a high-ranking religious man, would have written this prophecy of the popes in the 12th century, a credible prophecy verified from conclave to conclave. 
was enough to attract the attention of the church at the time, and even more today. How could the Vatican have missed this text? How does the church react to the prediction of its own destruction? The prophecy of the popes is on everyone's lips. It's giving a voice to the prophecy of Malachi. Announcing major upheaval, the prophecy is now coming to an end. But it is almost a miracle that the text ever reached us in the first place. If indeed this prophecy did interfere and bother the church, I think that since 1595 the church would have wiped this text out from existence and would not have transmitted it until today at the Library of Lyon. For the Church, has never approved of anything that remotely resembles a prophecy. The Catholic Church is always very close to the texts published about it, let alone a text on a canonized saint. At the time of the prophecy of the popes, it was the great era of the index and of all that is prophecy. Even Nostradamus was somewhat bothered. In some ways, the rejection of prophecies is in Christianity's DNA. Prophecies are common in the Old Testament. That's to say that one works only through prophecies. This applies all the way to Christ, who for Christians is considered the last of the great prophets. And this is why in the entire official history of Catholicism, no prophecies have been recognized as such. In essence, we have few prophecies, very marginal ones at that, such as those written by Nostradamus, for example, which are not recognized by the church. It's something that is more esoteric, something that is more parallel. This means we seldom have prophecy like this one, which come from a Benedictine monk within the church. That's why there's doubt around it. A prophecy that comes from a member of the church borders on heresy. And yet, in a way, the appearance of the prophecy of the popes came at the right time. The text helped the church. The simple thing was to clearly refute it and say, listen, it's insane. Anyone can interpret anything from these phrases. But I think that the Church soon realized the value of such a prophecy because it was a call for caution. It also stresses the importance that a probe has on the evolution. At the time, when the prophecy of the popes appeared, the Church was struggling and above all needed to be reassuring to the people. There was an interest in this prophecy from a number of ecclesiastical members, especially from popes, for several reasons. First, because it appeared around the Renaissance at a period devoted to esotericism. The text came to light at the end of the 16th century because the world was in great turmoil with the Protestants. They're the specter of the apocalypse, constantly on the lips of every Christian who saw the work of an antichrist everywhere. So in fact, this prophecy reassures everyone. Even the church didn't reject this prophecy phenomenon that provided them with a list of their popes. And for good reason. Saint Malachi announced 111 popes. When his prophecy was published, there were still close to 40 to come. The future of the papacy was secured via this list. This would explain why the prophecy of the popes was not ruled out at the time. But what about today? What does the church think of this text? I've heard very little about it here. It's considered as just another legend and doesn't fit with normal and usual analytical processes the church uses. Do we mention this text in church? Not at all, not at all. 
It's a very popular text because it provokes fantasies and movies, basically it makes you dream, but there's nothing much to it. Condemning a text is giving it even stronger publicity, so frankly it's not worth it. The church, however, did not hesitate to condemn the infamous novel The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. The bestseller that sold over 90 million copies was boycotted by churches all around the world. We're talking about the Da Vinci Code, which has been read by millions of readers around the world. It should be known that the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith had issued awful statements saying that no Catholic should either read or see the film. So how can the Vatican still turn its back on a prophecy announcing its own leader as the last one to exist? The Vatican doesn't talk about it officially, but it's very well known, universally known. The Vatican is too cautious, too mindful, to make itself the official spokesperson of such a text. Whereas, now the prophecy could well turn against them. Despite the silence from the Vatican on the matter, many dignitaries of Rome, including popes, believed in Malachi's text. After all, I believe that some popes will believe in it completely, others not at all, for reasons of personal faith, and some will use it politically. The interwar Pope Pius XI made a passing reference to Malachi in his encyclical Mit Brennen der Sorge. He exhorts the faithful to oppose the material strength of the oppressors of the Church with the intrepidity of a profound faith. The phrase of Pope Pius XI in the prophecy mentions the words, intrepid faith. Since the 16th century, a kind of game has emerged, an exchange of sorts between the popes and the prophecy, so much so that we do not know whether it's the prophecy that predicts the future of the church or whether it's the church walking in the footsteps of prophecy. For example, in the 17th and 18th centuries, several popes had their medals stamped and engraved with their prophetic phrase. The most striking example is John the 23rd, who on the day of his enthronement quoted his predecessor Pius the 12th using the Latin phrase of the prophecy of Malachi. But today, there has not been so much as a word from the representatives of the church. Silence is not an absence of communication. Silence itself constitutes communication. It's via silence that the Church communicates on the prophecy of the popes. Neither refuted nor recognized, the Vatican maintains the mystery and fantasies around the prophecy that could lead us all to our demise. What if the prophecy of the popes could still serve the Church? What if St. Malachi had written a prophetic and political text? While the prophecy was published in 1595, it appeared in the corridors of the Vatican five years earlier, just before the conclave of 1590 that elected Pope Gregory XIV. Probably not a coincidence. I think that initially it is a political text, since it's prophetic and political, it seeks to influence a conclave, so there is something very political about it. The monk in question did this to facilitate the election of a pope so that it better corresponded to their phrase, a form of political scheming, if you will. I think there is, in the Roman Catholic Church, certainly a sufficiently powerful order enough to impose on the various conclaves the realization of this prophecy. Yet, 
The conclave attended by the voting cardinals is extremely controlled and regulated perfectly and has been for centuries. Nowadays, as soon as the cardinals enter the Sistine Chapel, telephone and internet signals are jammed and the shutters are closed. Normally, the archbishops have complete freedom as to how they vote. The Cardinal Archbishop of Lyon, who voted at the last two conclaves, explains the process. It's after the first vote that we see how the votes are distributed. Many change their minds until the last minute. So when do they make their choice? When they take the small ballot paper and write the name of the one they chose. Then they continue down to the Sistine Chapel by holding their ballot like this and say a prayer, a very beautiful prayer, which could be valid for any election. I take as a witness Jesus who will judge me on the final day that the name I wrote is the one that, according to God, I judge the most suitable to fulfill this function. Which means I did not vote for a friend. I'm aware of the duty of the successor of the Pope, and among us, the one that seems to be the most adapted to this job, that is why I wrote his name. It is just before the conclave that the rules are far less strict. Before voting, the cardinals are gathered in order to have all the time necessary to discuss and negotiate. People discuss everything they want, voice their opinions on the current situation of the church, ask questions, share their intentions. No one is forced to speak. Someone can speak once, twice, three times. There is a fair deal of freedom. One or several cardinals could therefore potentially influence the conclave. It's difficult to confirm, but it's indeed possible. Prophetic? Political? One thing is certain, the prophecy of the popes has an important role to play. And if one were to take into account the political hypotheses, the Vatican itself could have written the prophecy or asked for it to be written. To find out, we must first ask whether Maliki Darmag really wrote this prophecy, or whether he was merely a figurehead. First, the prophecy of the popes was discovered 450 years after its official creation. This arouses suspicion. At that time, keeping an unpublished manuscript was bordering on the impossible. Furthermore, this prophecy of the pope seems to predict the future of the church with a great deal of precision. Too much detail. Is it just too good to be true? It's a strong theory, but the area of contention lies in the attribution of this prophecy to St. Malachi, while, in my opinion, he's not the author. Today, most specialists agree on this. Everything proves that Malachi had never made a prophecy. I think that no one believes anymore that St. Malachi wrote the prophecies himself. I think it just doesn't hold up. Indeed, disturbing facts attest that the true author of the prophecy of the popes is not Malachi. This prophetic text would not have been written in the 12th century, but at least 400 years later. How do we know? Because the true author of the prophecy of the popes was a tracer. The author of the prophecy is inevitably someone who worked on a particular edition of a book on popes. His name is Onofrio Panvinio and published his work in 1557. An Italian historian, Onofrio Panvinio, published in 1557 a book called A Brief History of Sovereign Pontiffs, in which he wrote a biographical record of each pope. However, the historian made a few mistakes. The author of this prophecy repeated the same errors. For example, in Panvinio's book published in 1557, Pope Eugene IV is said to have belonged to the Order of the Celestines, a characteristic taken up by the author of the Prophecy of the Popes. The phrase of Eugene IV is the Celestine she-wolf. The problem is that Eugene IV was not a Celestine, he was an Augustine. Second example, 
In the prophecy of the popes, the phrase attributed to John 22 is the cobbler of Osa. This pope was born in the city of Osa, but John 22 was not the son of a shoemaker, but the son of a banker. It's an error that can be found again in the work of Onofrio Panvino. At school, when the two students make the same mistakes, is that they've copied one another. The author of the prophecy of the popes copied from the book of the Italian historian. So this proves that this prophecy was written after 1557. Then why did the author not sign his text? Why attribute it to an Irish monk who later became a saint? Ireland was a country known for its prophecies and mysteries and being somewhat representative of the cult side of the Catholic Church. It's attributed to Malachi. As many Christians do, Gospels are very often attributed to people who have not written them. It's possible that John was not the author of the fourth Gospel, but that it was attributed to John. This applies to all the apocryphal Gospels. Take the attribution of the Gospel of Judah. It's known that this Gospel was written in the second century and that Judah had long since died, but it's nonetheless attributed to him. To give power and weight to a text, one simply claims a famous character from past as its author. So it's very likely that this this text was invented in the 16th century and attributed to a 12th century monk to give it more authority. The text has more potency if it's attributed to St. Malachi than to Arnold Villon. Might it be possible that Arnold Villon did not discover this text? Did he write it himself or did he order another prophet to write it before attributing it to an Irish saint? If the prophecy of the popes was not written in the 12th century, but at the end of the 16th century, it's unsurprising that the first phrases correspond to the popes. If we can say beyond a reasonable doubt that all the prophecies from 1140 to 1585 date from the knowledge of a certain number of invented texts, how do we explain those written after the text was published already? Curiously, certain phrases fit very well with the popes who followed in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and even 20th century. Let's check these claims. Pius VI became pope in 1776, almost two centuries after the publication of prophecy. His phrase in the prophecy is Peregrinus Apostolicus, the apostolic traveler. It's true that Pope Pius VI had made several trips abroad. Not very convincing evidence, except when you consider that before him, no pope had left Italy for several centuries. Innocent X was elected pope in 1644 on the 14th of September, the day of the exaltation of the cross. His phrase, Lucundudas crucis translates as the joy of the cross. Let's take the hundredth phrase, de balneis etruriae, from balnes in Etruria, refers to Gregory XVI, who belonged to the order of the Camaldules founded by Saint Romulad in Etruria. Urfus Velox, the swift bear, alludes to Pope Clement XIV, who had a racing bear as a family symbol. In recent history, the prophecy of the Pope remains just as pertinent. For instance, there is a phrase that mentions a depopulated religion, which, when you think about it, clearly corresponds to the World War I. Fascinating. Religio de Populat is the phrase attributed to Benedict XV, Pope from 1914 to 1922. The First World War caused millions of deaths throughout Europe. 1922 saw the publication of the census of the victims of the Great War, officializing the Religio de Populata. In an even more recent example, Pope John Paul I was referenced to in the prophecy of the popes by the phrase of half the moon. His reign was very short, 33 days of which the seventh moon, the middle moon, any year of 13 moons. 
In astrology, the year 1978 included 13 moons. It was at the halfway point of this astrological year that Pope John Paul I died, making him Mediate Lunae, a particularly troubling phrase from an astrological point of view, a phrase that could well lead us to the identification of the real author of this obscure text. The prophecy of the popes is thus surrounded by a persistent shadow of doubt. Was it written in the 12th or the 16th century? We're dealing with a text that is both prophetic and political. Finally, little is known of this mysterious yet credible prophecy. Many questions arise. Who is the true author of the prophecy? By ruling out Saint Malachy, who else could have done it? Did Arnold Villon lie by claiming to have found this text? Could he have ordered someone? What if the church had ordered the writing of this list? Who can have written the prophecy of the popes? One theory concerning the author of the prophecy of the popes stands out. According to several specialists, the author would be a well-known prophet who lived indeed during the 16th century since he copied the errors of a book published in 1557. A prophet interested in the sovereign pontiffs and the Catholic Church, and as certain phrases suggest, a prophet devoted to astrology. Let's not forget that this mysterious author must have been recognized and have proven himself during his lifetime. Only one person fits this description, and his name is Michel de Notre Dame, also known as Nostradamus. I believe that Nostradamus is the real creator of this list of popes. What evidence is there to reach this conclusion? First of all, Arnold Villon and Nostradamus lived at the same time in the 16th century. They were both born in the south of France. Arnold Villon could have found the writings of Nostradamus, a recognized prophet, perhaps even the most famous in the world apart from those evoked in the Bible or the Quran. But in the 16th century, the church kept a close eye on the prophet. So he could have written the prophecy of the popes without claiming it as his own. Another strong argument for Nostradamus, his preferred subjects. One of the main subjects of the quatrains of Nostradamus is, firstly, the church. There are also kingdoms, presidents, and other large institutions. These are some of the subjects we find in Nostradamus. Nostradamus is also fond of astrology. Nostradamus uses astrology as a dating system. He himself said that he had focused on ast astrological data as a basis for his prophecies. Other arguments still lead to Nostradamus. Passionate about coding and numbers, he was known to play with his readers. To understand the prophecies, we must mention numbers, since there are 111 phrases. This number is the decomposition of the letter Aleph in Hebrew. For my part, I would attribute the definitive creation of the text to someone who knew of the existence and the content of the Kabbalah. Again, this corresponds to Nostradamus. He was born in saint rémy de provence in 1503 of Jewish ancestry. His grandparents had converted to Catholicism, but continued to study ancient texts in Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and many other languages. But are the prophecies claimed by Nostradamus equal to those in the prophecy of the popes? Here are his famous centuries, published in 1555. A century is a set of a hundred prophetic quatrains, 
and upon closer reading, we pick up on disturbing hidden meanings. In the 20th quatrain of the 9th century, Nostradamus talks of a man who came to Varenne during the night, via Vortorte, Herne, and the White Stone, a man who brought with him storms, fire, and blood. On the 21st of June, 1791, Louis XVI fled to escape the revolutionaries. After passing through Voltorte, Herne, and the White Stone, he was arrested in Varenne. The revolutionary storm had caught up with him and promptly sent him to the guillotine. Almost 250 years before the events, this quatrain of Nostradamus gives the names of the four places Louis XVI passed through this fateful night. But that's not all. There are other passages in the prophecy of Nostradamus that are fulfilled, such as the foretelling of the death of King Henry II of France in a jousting accident from an eye injury. This famous quatrain appeared in 1555. The young lion will overcome the older one. On the field of combat, in a single battle, he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Two wounds made one, then he dies a cruel death. Four years after its publication on June 30th, 1559, Henry II, King of France, participated in a joust, a friendly duel at the double marriage of his daughter Elizabeth and his sister Marguerite. Henry II confronted the young Count of Montgomery, whose arms boasted a lion. The two lions wielded their lances, and upon impact, Montgomery's spear snapped, projecting a shard of wood straight into the eye of Henry II, who had lifted the visor of his golden helmet. A few days later, the king died, having succumbed to his injury. People are saying that Nostradamus was a joke. What he said was bogus. It's wrong. Nostradamus must be taken seriously. If Nostradamus actually wrote the prophecy of the popes, this might strengthen this text and its final omen. But is he really the author? Opinions differ on the matter. No, I don't think he would have gone about it that way. He would have written long sentences, long phrases with profound symbolism. In the prophecy, there are very few phrases that are long. Then who else could be the author of the prophecy of the popes? It goes without saying that we rightly question the origin of the author who wrote this prophecy, and Arnold Villon is obviously part of those who could have written it. I think it's the Benedictine monk. I think it's Arnold Villon. Nostradamus, Villon, a prophet or a monk? Either of these two could have written the prophecy of the popes. Which one? The answer to the secret disappeared over the last few centuries. The Malachi prophecy, really, who cares about the author? What is important is the phrases. The main question remains to be asked, who benefits from the crime? The prophecy of the popes is therefore not only a legend invented to announce the end of the world, but also a powerful tool that would lead the church and its institutions towards a brutal and final change, a text which could have been written in order to influence various conclaves. It's true that every time a pope dies and another is elected, we speak of the prophecy of Malachi. Funny, don't you think? The actions of the popes themselves seem to be guided by prophecy. You can see that with the prophecy of Malachi, many popes have used and cited its phrases. There is a man of the 20th century who was undoubtedly the most representative of the prophecy within the church. This man is Pope John 23. While rumors said he was a Freemason, the illustrious, unknown bishop was elected only after the third round of the conclave of 1958 and undertook the renewal of the church. A renewal which would be inscribed in the application of the last paragraph of the prophecy. A renewal called the Second Vatican Council. 
Pope John the 23rd almost prophetically wanted the Second Vatican Council and finished by formally opening it. Vatican II is still a topical issue and would have led the Church towards the end of the papacy. But not only did John 23 put into action the prophecy of the popes, he himself was a powerful prophet recognized by the Church. I believe Pope John XXIII was a prophet. According to him, the final judgment was imminent. Who is this man whom even Pope Francis wished to be canonized urgently upon his arrival? In 1973, Pierre Carpi, a famous Italian contemporary author, published the book Prophecies of John 23, in which he claims that Angelo Roncalli, the future Pope John 23, had also predicted the final judgment. In addition to using phrases from the prophecy of the popes, John 23 was prone to having visions. I believe he was a prophet. John the 23rd was filled with kindness, a prophetic man. In his prophecies, he addressed many themes, such as communism, Nazism, and especially the papacy. Like the prophecy of the popes, John 23 himself predicted several pontificates. In an eighth prophecy written in 1935, Angelo Roncalli announced a pope, and among the details he gives, some are particularly explicit. He will be elected in a period when Italy is marked by blood, Rome in bloody days. This pope will also have a privileged connection with young Catholics. It will be the young people who will praise you. This Pope will be wounded, but the wound will heal. Your only wound will heal. This corresponds to a well-known pontiff, Pope John Paul II. Elected in 1978, in the midst of the years of lead in Italy, John Paul II created World Youth Day. John Paul II was also a victim of an attack in 1981, from which he pulled through. Pope John XXIII announced the fate of Pope John Paul II 43 years before his arrival. The credibility of his prophecies is put into question, but then what does he think of the 28th prophecy of John XXIII? He sees the apocalypse in a very dark period for Italy and the whole of Europe. Pope John XXIII called for a third Italy, a prediction which may seem innocuous at first, but which is in fact rich in meaning. For Pope John XXIII, in his prophecies, he announced the Third Italy, that is to say, after Roman Italy, the Roman Republic, and after Catholic Italy, he announced the Third Italy, a new Italy, after a very difficult period. A Third Italy after Catholic Italy. The omen is clear, it is the end of the papacy, if not the end of the world. The prophecy of the popes and the prophecy of John 23 are already too closely related and particularly credible texts that announce the end of Rome and worse, of the world. Pope John 23, in addition to having deliberately cited the prophecy of the pope during his pontificate, experienced visions 
How can the church accept such an outrage? And here again, as for the prophecy of the popes, the Vatican is not concerned by it, officially. We're happy to study the numerous texts published by the popes, both by John the 23rd and by the others. Unfortunately, I don't have much to say about the text of John the 23rd. It is difficult to believe that the writings of a pope went unnoticed in Rome. The Church will never condemn the text, but will go so far as to canonize Pope John 23 and in an exceptional way. It's surprising that we could have successively made two canonizations. Specialists of the prophecy often ask how it's possible not to recognize what Pope John 23 had done, said and written. April 27, 2014, St. Peter's Square, Vatican City. 800,000 pilgrims from all over the world attend an extraordinary event. For the first time in the history of the Church, two popes were to be canonized, that is, declared holy and at the same time. Still more surprisingly, this double canonization took place in the presence of two other popes, the current Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Emeritus. Very quickly, the event was nicknamed the Day of the Four Popes. Never had the Roman Catholic Church experienced anything of the sort. We're talking about an absolute breathtaking event. The fact that Pope Francis chose these two popes is a very strong indication of the path being continued. There's a text, one of the two prophecies out of the 32, which explains that the Catholic Church is going to abandon itself with two heads and one mother, mother of the Church, two heads, two emperors, Benedict the Sixteenth and his renunciation, and Pope Francis, who was elected. What, then, was the message that Francis wanted to convey to the whole world? Pope John XXIII prophesied the arrival of John Paul II. He understood the Second Vatican Council, which entailed the end of the papacy. John Paul II applied it. It was almost obvious that these two popes had to be canonized together. Did Francis want to pay tribute to the Second Vatican Council? Yes, I'm convinced, because we need Vatican II. Is it a tribute to Vatican II? Yes, it can be interpreted that way, as Vatican II was opened by John XXIII. And these predecessors sought not to go behind it, but at least to perpetuate it. This theory holds up since Francis also beatified Pope Paul VI on October 19, 2014. Pope from 1963 to 1978, it was he who concluded Vatican II. Pope Paul VI was also Vatican II. It was Paul VI who took over Vatican II and finished it. Vatican II is the most significant event in the history of the Church in the 20th century. It is a council, an assembly of bishops from all over the world gathered to debate the direction to be taken by the Catholic Church. Vatican II symbolizes the opening to the modern world and the return to the roots of Christianity. In short, a simpler church for a complex era. And if it is indeed the case, and that Pope John XXIII opened this council in 1962, Pope John Paul II subscribed to it. Pope John XXIII wanted, in an almost prophetic way, the Second Vatican Council and initiated it. John Paul II, on the other hand, was one of the founding fathers of the Council. It's very interesting. He was the man that life had led to dialogue with the world, always following in the footsteps of the Second Vatican Council. A Vatican II that might represent John 23's answer to his own visions, but also to the prophecy of the popes. I still call Vatican II a rebirth of the Church, an awakening, an awakening of the Church. The mission of Vatican II would seem to be to save the destiny of the Church. The prophecy is coming to an end. This is the end of the prophecy. The Church must increase its efforts if it wants to defuse the prophecy of the popes. 
We're in the 21st century. The church will not survive 2,000 years if it is founded on the same foundations as the past centuries. You'll see, we'll have a few surprises. I'm not a bird of ill omen, but people know very well that there was a downward spiral. And Francis, the last pope, could well be the one. Since his election, the sovereign pontiff has accumulated references to the prophecy of the popes. Even Pope Francis says we must return to essential values. He says it because he knows very well that everything is crumbling down. He feels it, he sees it. One only needs to listen to his first words and study his first acts to understand that the prophecy of the popes is present in the Vatican. The surprise for all of us was going to the tomb of Pope Sixtus V. For what reason? Pope Sixtus V is the only pope thanks to whom we can date the end of the prophecy. And Pope Benedict XVI would have also precipitated the destiny of Pope Francis. The prophecy is very precise, a well-oiled machine. The Pope Emeritus would have triggered the final countdown in full knowledge of the facts. Pope Benedict XVI is referenced by the prophecy of the popes as Gloria Olivae, the glory of the olive tree. The 111th phrase holds a prominent place in the list of the last popes, because after him, no more exist. There remains only the final sending, the last apocalyptic paragraph of the prophecy. In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations. And when these things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The end. The paragraph announcing this Petrus Romanus is different from the 111 phrases. The structure of the text is broken. And as if to stick to the prophecy, Benedict XVI created this rupture. February 11, 2013, a bombshell hit the Vatican. The Pope announced to the faithful that he would voluntarily step down from his position. Thank you for your sympathy. I have decided to resign from the position that the Lord entrusted to me since April 19, 2005. It's fascinating. There are 111 phrases, and we get to the last one. Pope Benedict XVI, he goes on to abdicate. If he was on the 108th on the list, it wouldn't have impressed me as much. We would have said, you know, he's renounced because there's another pope, etc. But in this case, it's written at the end of Lingnum Vitae. Instead of someone dying a physical death, we've got someone who's withdrawn from office. By resigning, Pope Benedict XVI allowed the prophecy to come to an end and led his successor on the path to the apocalypse. Two words, extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. This is the first time in the history of the Roman Catholic Church that a living pope renounced his office outside of papal wars. Benedict XVI chose to resign not on a random day. His resignation was effective not on the day he announced it, but on the 28th of February, the day of St. Romanus of Condat and that day Peter's seat will be vacant. Pope Benedict XVI's resignation is such an extraordinary event. It is almost an insult to the Roman Curia and to all that is happening right now in the papacy, definitely a separation. A separation that the Pope's communication department still has trouble swallowing. 
You can't even imagine what happened to us that day. It was a holiday. The anniversary of the state of the Vatican, the 11th of February. All the offices were closed, and ours too. A journalist called me and asked me whether the Pope had really resigned. And I didn't even know. It was a huge surprise within the Church. The renunciation of Benedict XVI was a surprise, a dazzling surprise. I wasn't expecting it since I had only seen him a little beforehand. I found him very, very alert and attentive. We had a very nice discussion with all the bishops of our province. We had all come to pay him a visit, and I said to myself, he's in good form for a man of 85 years old. Shortly after, he resigned, so yes, it did surprise me. Again, it is difficult to know whether it is the prophecy of the popes that predicted the future, or whether it influenced it. Did Pope Benedict XVI renounce on the 28th of February, the day of the Romanus of Conduct, to leave his place to the Chosen One, to the Savior, to Peter the Roman? Was Benedict XVI merely a transitional pope? I believe that the cardinals in the conclave who elected John Paul II's successor, Pope Benedict XVI, probably elected, and of course, I have no proof, a transitional pope. I find that Pope Benedict XVI perfectly fulfilled his transitional role after such a wildly popular pope. Benedict XVI, a transitional pope? Maybe. Rumors suggest that at the conclave that elected him in 2005, Jorge Mario Begoglio, the future Pope Francis, was the one who received the most votes. It's said that at the conclave where Joseph Ratzinger was elected as Pope Benedict XVI, people were thinking about Bergoglio, the Argentinian. It's mostly speculation, but maybe he didn't feel ready yet. I think Pope Francis' arrival is good timing. I think it would have been too early if he'd been elected instead of Pope Benedict the 16th. I believe there was a time for everything. Once again, the history of the Church appears to have been written centuries ago in the prophecy of the popes. The prophecy is very precise, like a well-oiled machine. Successive conclaves have only one goal, to make the prophecy come true one way or another. Will Pope Francis, the first Jesuit in the history of the papacy, witness the end of the world and be the last pope? Tuesday, March 12th, 2013. The Cardinals reunited in conclave. Their mission? To elect a new pope. According to the prophecy, the sovereign pontiff would be the first to have no phrase assigned to him. The Church therefore making a great leap into the unknown. After two days of indecisive black smoke, white smoke announced to the whole world that the Church had a new pope. The bells of Rome resonated, spreading the news throughout the city and across the world. After five rounds of voting, the Argentine Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio had reached the pinnacle of Vatican power. In St. Peter's Square, Hundreds of thousands of faithful followers discovered the face and voice of their new guide. Brothers and sisters, good evening. Buonasera. As foretold by the prophecy, is he the last pope in the history of the Catholic Church? The one who will witness the destruction of Rome? Let us pray for everyone, because we are a great brotherhood. 
Is Francis conscious and prepared for the terrible sentence of the prophecy of the popes? Some troubling parts suggest that this could be the case. First of all, that evening, Pope Francis asked the crowd for a particularly surprising prayer, a prayer that had never been asked by any other pope before him. Very powerful words broadcasted worldwide on television. And now I would like to give the blessing, but first I want to ask you a favor. Before the bishop blesses the people, I ask that you would pray to the Lord to bless me. The prayer of the people for their bishop. Let us say this prayer, your prayer for me, in silence. A request that he also put on Twitter, causing a buzz on the web and making the prophecy of the popes a hot topic once again. The first thing he asked the crowd was pray for me. We thought he was going to ask us to pray for us, seeing the world of chaos in which we live in, but no, it was pray for me. He might be aware of the terrible burden he's been giving and is worried about the prophecy, because at each conclave, the prophecy is fulfilled. Although this sentence is subject to different interpretations, it remains unclear. Secondly, Pope Francis does not have the usual profile. Is it by chance that he became the first Jesuit elected at the head of the church? The new pontiff seems to be all set to fulfill the prophecy. The Jesuits are known for their austerity, far removed from the glittering and opulent image shown off by the Vatican. Right from the start, by the choice of his name, the newly elected pope seems to want to put the church back on the right path. Francesco de l'Homo della Pace. E così... Francis is a man of peace, and this is how the name came into my heart, Francis of Assisi. He is for me a man of poverty, a man who loved and protected creation. At this very moment, are experiencing a difficult relationship with creation. This man gives me the spirit of peace. How I would love a church that is poor and for the poor. A humble pope who washes the feet of prisoners, who refuses to live in the pontifical apartment, who wears more discreet outfits than his predecessors. The first messages sent by the new pope are clear. There is going to be change in Rome, and the extreme ostentation of the Vatican may be living its final days. If the prophecy is to be believed, these drastic changes could go as far as the role of the Pope itself. Thus, the first words of Pope Francis seem to fall in line with the prophecy of the Popes. He presented himself as the Bishop of Rome. The first thing he said on the balcony of St. Peter's Square was, I am the Bishop of Rome, which, by the way, is true since Pope Francis, before becoming the Pope, was the Bishop of Rome. But it's surprising that this was the first thing he said. Some have pointed out that this was a way of actually connecting the prophecy of Malachi and conveying the Roman aspect of the Pope. Even Pope Francis says we must return to essential values. He says it because he knows very well that everything is crumbling down. He feels it. He sees it. The third element making Francis the last link in prophecy is an act, his first official visit. Thursday, March 14th, 2014. Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore. Pope Francis chose this location for his first visit. Officially, he comes here to pray for the Virgin Mary. The Basilica is indeed linked to the Virgin. Pope Francis took a few minutes to kneel before the statue of the Mother of Christ.
But once again, the man in power seemed to hint at the prophecy of the popes. After praying for the Virgin Mary, he made his way to another chapel of the basilica. Pope Francis then kneeled down, facing a mysterious tomb. The surprise was going to the tomb of Pope Sixtus V. The Pope, who allowed us to date the prophecy, rested right there, right before Pope Francis. The phrase attributed to Sixtus V is axis in meditae figni, axle in the midst of a sign. The word sign often denotes a prophecy. The pontificate of Sixtus V was at the halfway point of the prophecy of the popes. Is it therefore thanks to him that it is possible to date the end? So why come here and on his first visit? Did Francis know that the prophecy was soon to end? Was he praying to save the papacy, to save Rome, to fulfill the prophecy? Is Francis really the last pope? According to an oral tradition passed down onto us, the text published in 1595 is incomplete and is missing a phrase. There is not only the text of the prophecy of the popes that has come to us. Throughout the centuries, an oral tradition says that there is an additional phrase. According to this oral transmission, Saint Malachi returned to Rome and following his vision and inspiration added a last pope that the text calls Caput Nigrum. This is what reached us a written tradition and an oral tradition that has added a pope called Caput Nigrum. Caput Nigrum, black leader. According to this oral tradition, the phrase Caput Nigrum is supposed to take its place between Gloria Olivae Pope Benedict XVI, and the final sending of the text. In this case, Pope Francis is the famous Caput Nigrum, a black pope who also evokes Nostradamus in his famous centuries. In many of his quatrains, Rome and Italy are targeted. One particular quatrain, the 25th of the 6th century talks, of a strange character who must fight the Antichrist. In these troubled times of the church, a young black red will lead the hierarchy. A red for Nostradamus means a cardinal, and a black a Jesuit. If one leads the hierarchy, it is that he becomes pope. So in essence, he prophesied the emergence of a black pope in a doomsday context. Francis was the only Jesuit present at the conclave. Francis is indeed the black pope whom everybody is speaking about. So is he the last or the second to last pope? Caput Nigrum. Who was elected? A Jesuit. The pope of the Jesuits is a general, and this general of the Jesuits is a black pope. There's something going on here, and knowing that the church is surrounded by mysterious events, it would make sense for us to be interested in this. It wouldn't be unreasonable to think that Francis could be that very Peter the Roman. Should we believe in the existence of this missing phrase? One thing is certain. The fact that Francis is a Jesuit is the key element that makes him the ideal candidate to either disprove or fulfill the prophecy. He's a man of great discernment and foresight, a man whose self-demanding nature is as great as his kindness, a pope who does not settle for just public speaking, but a pope who acts. Everything leads us to believe that Francis is considered a savior, but how can we be certain? 
Let's take a look again at the facts. Pope Francis embarked on spectacular reform programs in the media, finance, the curia. All areas seem to have been targeted. In fact, he's a reformist while not appearing to be. I prefer not to use the word reformer, but rather reorganizer. And the most significant reform is that of the curia. Pope Francis appointed eight cardinals to help him fulfill his mission, the so-called G8. The current system in the Vatican is entirely pyramidal and is steeped in history. Although this structure dates back only a few centuries, it is still today an absolute monarchy, and Pope Francis clearly wants to change that. It's in the spirit of the prophecy of the popes that Francis has renounced his powers as pope. There's no more final infallible decision. Now, when you have eight people who represent the eight regions of the world, the message you say is no longer the word of a king or a pope. It is a shared message. It's the arrival of an almost democratic process inside the Vatican. This is the end of the Vatican. Has Francis undertaken his reform initiatives to save the church from its miserable fate? Or was it to fulfill the prophecy? Is he one of the last popes? To answer this question, we might find our answer not from the secrecy of Vatican men, but from the walls that cloister them. Rome, St. Paul's Basilica outside the walls, one of the four major basilicas of the city of Seven Hills. More than 1,500 years ago, this site was the location of a Christian edifice, where the Apostle Paul was buried. But it is also part of a very symbolic ritual for the Vatican. Inside the building, a frieze represents all the popes of history from St. Peter to the present day. In gilded medallions, a mosaic portrait depicts each sovereign pontiff and the dates of his pontificate. Abbot Edmund Power, in charge of this basilica, was kind enough to tell us about it. Inside the Basilica of St. Paul, we have a series of mosaic medallions for all the popes throughout history. The first is that of St. Peter. And the last is that of Pope Francis. And as Pope Francis is the current sovereign pontiff, his medallion is illuminated by a light. The most recent portrait is obviously that of Francis and the Church, who follows the prophecy of the popes to a T. They have already foreseen the end of the papacy. It is said that when all places are taken, then it will be the end of the world. Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Francis, the Vatican and the city of Rome, everybody seems to know that the papacy is about to end. The Catholic Church no longer has the influence it used to have. Is it possible to consider the end of the papacy if this prophecy were to come to an end? How can the prophecy of the popes have guided the destiny of the Church for centuries? Is it as if the Vatican was subject to a truly inescapable divine countdown? Will the prophecy of the popes come to an end? This is the end of the prophecy. Is Francis the last of the popes? Should we prepare for the apocalypse? The prophecy is not a crystal ball. It's a spirit. So what's going to happen? Will the countdown soon come to an end? prophecy of the popes is an arid text, a succession of small sentences, no names, no numbers, no dates. 
The prophetic texts are encrypted and decipherable at the right moment, which is absolutely mind-boggling. Several specialists believe that the prophecy of the popes does not escape this rule. There is a passage in the prophecy of Saint Malachi which is ultimately indicates the middle of the prophecy. This passage is the phrase Axis in mediate figni, axle in the midst of a sign, attributed to Pope Sixtus V. The first phrase of the prophecy of the popes corresponds to Pope Celestine II, elected in 1143. Sixtus V became Pope in 1585, 442 years later. If this marks the middle of the prophecy, it must end 442 years later, in 2027. All this is calculated in a logical and rational way, except that this rationality is used for a prophecy. According to another prophet, Pope John 23, Doomsday will take place a few years later. One of the 32 prophecies which seem to explain that the Catholic Church is going to be abandoned with two heads and one mother. In other words, the mother of the Church and two emperors. One can see the similarity with Pope Benedict XVI's renunciation and Pope Francis, who was elected during Benedict XVI's lifetime. He also states, amazingly, that the end will be 2,000 years plus the age of Christ. According to Pope John 23, the apocalypse will take place in 2033, the date of the end of these prophecies. 2033, 2027, two texts announcing troubling events not too far from each other in the future. On closer inspection, these events could happen sooner than predicted. On the 27th of November 2012, Pope Benedict XVI published his third book devoted to Jesus. In his work, the Sovereign Pontiff talks about the birth of Christ. According to him, Jesus was not born in the year zero, but a little earlier. He writes a book openly saying that finally we were wrong about the dates and that there is certainly six or seven years of difference. This does not change anything for the dates in the prophecy of the popes. It is its duration that is coded. But for the text of Pope John 23, this potentially changes everything. If there is indeed a six-year lag before the birth of Jesus, the date given by John 23 2001 plus the age of Christ could announce doomsday six years before, in 2027. We can see once again the acts of a sovereign pontiff going in the direction of the prophecy of the popes and making it coincide with the predictions of John 23. Why do these two prophecies announce the end of time? What will happen in 2027? The prophecy of the popes of John 23 announces the final judgment, the apocalypse, the end of Rome. But must we really take this threat seriously? Of course, we are faced with a problem of interpretation. In any case, we're at the end. Now, what does the apocalypse mean and the collapse of Rome mean? It's a mystery. First possibility, the end of the papacy. The prophecy of Malachi says that the papacy could end, and that I believe. In this case, what's most likely is that the Pope would become a simple bishop of Rome. You know that the duty of the conclave is to provide Rome with a bishop. For at the beginning, the one who sat on the throne of St. Peter was only the bishop of Rome and Christians were united. Perhaps the main obstacle to ecumenism is the Pope. 
And what if the prophecy of the popes only predicted the end of the omnipotence of Rome over the church? The prophecy of Malachi is a serious reminder to the Catholic Church that the papacy is not a monarchy, but something that can be transformed into openness and love. And what if Petrus Romanus, Peter of Rome, was the founder of a new church? The main mission of the next pope, who is mentioned in the prophecy of St. Malachi, Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman, will certainly be to reconcile the churches. An ideal, comforting alternative to the disastrous prophecy. Second possibility, the apocalypse. A catastrophe of this scale at the heart of humanity, or simply within the Catholic Church, that's something that the next pope will have to face. We can't hide the important coincidence of this catastrophe. 2027, the end according to the prophecy of the popes. 2027, the last judgment. What if both predictions are correct? And if the end of the papacy coincided with the end of time? All this we shall know in 2027, the year when just maybe the prophecy of the popes will be fulfilled.